Hello, I'm Jerry Godwin, and I'd like to welcome you to our Sunday School lesson today for November the 13th, and the title of the lesson is So Rejoice, and it's taken from Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25. That's Isaiah chapter 65, verses 17 through 25, and in preparation for next Sunday's lesson, which will be um, November the 20th, uh, the title is So Come Home, and it's taken from Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 8. That's Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 1 through 8. And I would like to just give you all the thanks in the world for continuing to view uh, these Sunday School lessons. It's such a blessing to me to be able to share with you, and I, and I pray that it's a blessing to you and friends and families and, and, and that you will share this with them. If you are watching on YouTube, um, be sure to like, make comments, and share uh, with others. Do not forget to click on the bell so that you will get regular updates to our videos. And as we begin our time of prayer, as we always do, please remember individuals that you have on your mind that you will pray for, intercede for them for their specific needs and specifically, if you have, if you know individuals that does, that does not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, please be in prayer for them as we pray for them. And let us know if there are those that make professions of faith. Also, please remember situations. And we, we're in a situation right now in our country uh, where we're having, uh, yesterday was voting day. Please pray for our leaders, for our president and, and the executive and legislative and, and judicial branches, that they might lead us in the way that God would inspire them to lead us. And also for yourself. Don't forget to pray for yourself, for your specific needs, and that you might grow in faith and knowledge of Jesus Christ, and that you might be um, a witness to your families, your church, and, and those around us. And for you that are members of Little Rock and Richmond Free Will Baptist Church, I pray for you and lift you up that you might grow in, in your faith and that we as a church here at Little Rock will benefit from your faith and your love for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us go to the Lord in prayer right now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, this day and this beautiful day you've given us. Lord, we have so many prayers on our minds for sickness and death and, and other situations from which we are aware from individuals. We lift them up right now to you, Lord. We know that you care for us, that you love us, and from this lesson today, we will know that, that you indeed do love us beyond our sinful condition and that because of your grace and your mercy, Lord, that we have the opportunity and the privilege to repent of our sins, to ask for forgiveness and turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, that we might seek a better relationship with you because we know that you desire a relationship with all of us. Our Heavenly Father, we lift up the lost souls that individuals that are listening right now know of and, and right now on our prayer list that these souls might be reached. Lord, give us a sense of urgency to reach these uh, persons for Jesus Christ Speak to them, Holy Spirit, that they might recognize that it is God calling them and recognize, Lord, that, that they might submit their sins commit, and commit their sins to you 
and ask for forgiveness in order that they might seek to follow Christ as their Savior and be a disciple. Lord, we just thank you for this privilege um, of teaching, this, this privilege of being able to share your word with others around us, that, that we all might grow uh, closer to God, our Father, and also uh, to each other, that as the body of Christ, that we, will, that we can serve you in the way that you desire us to serve. We pray all these things that your Son's precious name is glorified. Amen. Last Sunday we studied from um, the book of uh, Haggai. And once again we were in the situation where Judah had been taken captive by um, Babylon and they had been sent to Babylon and this uh, this book in chapter 62 65 of Isaiah is considered part of what is called the last chapters of Isaiah as the third Isaiah because this is post exile and this is when Cyrus had King Cyrus of Persia had defeated Babylon and he had allowed the um, Israelites, the Judites, to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. And as we learned last week, they dragged their feet for a while, but then God sent word through Haggai and they finally finished the temple. And it was not physically as glorious as the glorious temple of King David, but it was glorious in that they were obedient to God and, and that the people were, were reacting and declaring faithfulness to God their Father and, and swore um, to be faithful and not worshiping idols and keeping dietary laws and supporting um, the destiny of God's people. Now, I, I would like to ask you, um, you don't have to do it because I can't see you, but ask to um, close, close your eyes and think of the most beautiful place that you have ever been. And it, this is personal, it, you know, you, you may have, you and your spouse or your brother and sister may all have a, or children, may have a different place, but think about that beautiful place for just a moment. And as you're thinking about that, think about what you see with your mind's eye. Are you seeing beautiful colors? A beautiful day. Um, how are you feeling? What's the temperature like? Is it a, is it perfect where you are? Think about the sounds that you hear. Think about if your taste is involved, or if your touch is involved. What you are experiencing in this beautiful place. I have one that comes to mind, and and it's, it's, um brings uh, just good feelings about being there with my uh, wife and family, and and how glorious that place is. But now, open your eyes and think for just a moment that in today's lesson, with the restoration of Jerusalem and the promises of God the Father. We're going to see a Jerusalem and a Judea and a place of harmony with God for which we can rejoice that will exceed any of the things that we have experienced to date here on earth. 
Now, in Revelation, it's written, uh, Revelation 21, verses 1 through 4. And this sounds so familiar hundreds of years before in the book of Isaiah. John writes in Revelation, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first, first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men and will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. This is a new heaven that is spoken of in Jerusalem. Now open your eyes and see what God has in store for Judah and for us in the 21st century as his church, a new relationship with God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he begins in verse 65, in verse 17, For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. The former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. God is promising Judah, and he's promising us that when he establishes this new relationship, this new kingdom here on earth, that he's not going to remember, in Judah's case, he's not going to remember their disobedience. He's not going to remember their sinfulness. And he's wiping the slate clean. Now, my brothers and sisters and friends, when Jesus saves us, he remembers our sin no more. Now, the prophet Isaiah um, shows a gl glorious vision of new paradise, a place of peace and safety and security and help and stability and well-being. This sounds like the lower rung of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, but it's beyond that, that God has prepared this place for us of peace and security and health and well-being. I want to go there, don't you? And where now we have difficulties and challenges with race and gender and class and we're destroying our planet. But if I was, if, we, if God has taken care of us of this, if I was ushered into paradise and I came upon um, this creation, what would be my stewardship to God? We see this perfect place, but in this perfect relationship, we still have a responsibility for stewardship uh, to God. We are responsible for preparing our hearts and minds and souls and reaching out to our neighbors to love our neighbors as ourselves and to treat others with kindness and be a stewardship of our resources. And this is the perfect world in which God, perfect being mature and at a level that we can glorify his name. And he says, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I am creating, for I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. Now here they have been delivered from exile God has fulfilled his promise to them, and they have been delivered to Jerusalem. 
My friends, God has delivered me. God has delivered you. And when we serve him, when we are glad for the relationship that we have with God, there is joy in our heart. Joy much like shalom, the peace. That joy is an all-encompassing joy in our lives. And, and haven't you seen, haven't you seen and witnessed the joy that is in people's lives that you know is coming from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit and is coming from the empowerment of God? I pray that we have a church. We have a church that loves one another, that don't backbite, don't don't stab each other in the back, but our focus is to become more Christ-like. As Paul said, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is Christ. I want others to see in me and my brothers and sisters here at Little Rock and in you, in your communities from wherever you are, I want them to see and God wants to be able to see Christ living in you. He says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and delight in my people. What a joy that would be and what a delight that would be for Christ to be able to look at us and see us functioning as the body of Christ. No more shall there be sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. Now, there were periods of crying. Can you imagine when they had been, been in Babylon and every night before they went to bed that they probably, especially children and young adults and young marriage, they didn't know how long this exile was going to last and they cried themselves to sleep. I thought about a song, a country song from several years ago. Think I'll go somewhere and cry myself to sleep. And he says, I think I'll go somewhere and cry myself to sleep, not because I'm sad, but because I'm weak. We all have periods and seasons of mourning and grief and sadness in our lives. But my friends, we serve a living Christ that loves us and that died for us on the cross. We should be the people of joy, not tears and and God says that the sound of weeping will not be, no more sounds of weeping will be heard in it. Or the cries of distress where a warring country like Babylon or Assyria or Persia will be on the outskirts of a city to take over. We have periods of crying. We have periods of crying during the pandemic during death of so many in our church and so many in our families. But because of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ, we have a period of joy because there will be no more crying. And yes, we'll have periods of sadness, but in this church that Christ is, is, is building, this new temple, in not built with hands. This new temple that he has built will be a time of rejoicing and not tears. And then he goes on in verse 24 and says, No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days, or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one who dies at a hundred years old will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. Now, here the, the writer of Isaiah is writing in hyperbole, which mean, means exaggeration, exaggerated term for emphasis of the, of the point. Now, because of war, because of things that happen in war, infants lost their lives. They, they died young because they might not have the food or they may have died from war itself. And the same is true of older people. It doesn't mean that everyone 
will live to be 100 years old. My mother just passed uh, in September, and she was 94, and she was in really good shape up to the very end. And we know other people. I, I know someone that is uh, about 102 now, and, and there were people that live to be 100. And that would be a great thing if we are in good health. But it says, what it's saying here is the promise that the relationship that we have with God will allow us to live longer than someone that is disobedient or sinful in, in, in our relationship to God. And he says, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. He said, the place that we're going to have, this new Jerusalem, is the people are going to be able to build houses and live in them and plant vineyards and plant crops and reap the benefits of them. That hasn't been true historically for Judah. When they were going through their um, the, the war with um, Babylon, they had destroyed their homes, they had destroyed their crops, so the animals and the people um, suffered because of their sinfulness and their disobedience. And they said, they shall not build another, in, another inhabitant. They shall not plant and another eat. In other words, they're not going to plant, they're saying before the war, that Judah planted fruit and vineyards and the Babylonians benefited from that. They said, that's not the way it's going to be anymore. This is the promise from God. And he said, My chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Now, I know that I look like I should not be old enough to retire. Just kidding. I, I am. I'm 70 years old and, and proud to be, blessed to be 70 years old. And I enjoyed working. My, my brothers and sisters and all my friends in the, in the 50s and early 60s, we grew up in a time when we all worked in eastern North Carolina on farms. And we learned from early on the benefit of hard work. And if you don't believe it, you look at the workforce today for people that don't want to work, they'd rather not work and get paid than to work. I still wish sometimes that I had a job, but there's other reasons that I, that I can't. But it says here that this new Jerusalem, that the people will have jobs and that they will enjoy the work of their hands. Now, I'm envious of someone that can do, build things with their hands. My daddy was, uh, our daddy was a carpenter for a while. But I, I know these craftsmen, that craftsmen, and men and women that can build beautiful objects with their hands. And right here in Wilson, North Carolina, we have New Common, Wilson County. We have the Whirligig Park, and you can Google that. And we knew um, the man that built these huge structures, structures that are moved by the slightest wind. And how amazing that is to me. Thou shalt not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity. For they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Now, prayer is talking about prayer here. Sometimes, um, we understand the power of prayer, but sometimes we are frustrated, if we are honest, we are frustrated by our inability to pray. But here's the good news is, is that our prayer is no um, burden in communicating, our lack of prayer, we're communicating with God. In Romans chapter 8, verses 26 and 27, it says, in the same way, 
The Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we, what we ought to pray, pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us when groans and words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of God. Now we can stumble in our prayer and we, sometimes we can uh, uh, reach a stalemate where we don't even know what to pray for. And many times in my, my life, I don't know what to pray, but I will pray and continue to pray and the Holy Spirit intercedes for us to God the Father that His will will be done. And isn't that what the perfect prayer is? That the, Thy will God, thy will be done. And show me where you're working. Put me there, God, and let me live according to uh, your will. And then the last verses, it says, The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. But the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy, on my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now here we have the predator, like the, the wolf, and the prey, like the sheep, will be laying down one, one, one with another in peace and harmony. What a glorious day that will be. And these, in our lives, our adversaries, our enemies, that Christ said to love our enemies, as we love ourselves, to love our neighbors, to love one another, to love Christ as he loved the church. This is the church that Christ is building in the new Jerusalem. I want to live, I want to live, don't you, in that glorious day where our relationship with, a, with God and his people um, and this lesson should teach us to begin with that God, God himself controls history. Habakkuk said, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you not hear me? And Isaiah reassures his people that God still controls history and he will re reestablish them in the promised land. Isaiah further states that in the future, will exceed their greatest expectations. We have a future with God here on earth. He, Christ taught us how to live in this world that he might be glorified and that we would have a life that would have a relationship with him that would be pleasing. And so many times we fall short of that. And finally, Isaiah promises that he will restore the spirit of community that our brothers and sisters, you and I, will have this harmony because of our mutual and love for Christ. Now, um, Squire Parsons had a song several years ago, and the name of it was Beulah Land, and I'm not going to sing it, but it started out in the first verse, and it says, I'm kind of homesick for a country to which I've never been before, no sad goodbyes will there be spoken, for time won't matter anymore. Beulah land, Beulah land, I'm longing for you, and someday on thee I'll stand. There my home shall be eternal. Beulah land, sweet Beulah land. Um, Beulah land, the word Beulah means to marry, and Christ as the, as the groom has married his church. And we have the beautiful land where we can inhabit today in the 20th century, in the 21st century, that God's, Jesus Christ's name will be glorified. I'll leave you with this, that the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns and God, with God the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, 
now and forever. Amen.